Up to this point, we've been talking about making moral decisions based upon a certain kind of criteria. And that criteria is established by way of worship. And to use Sedgwick's language, that your piety or your relationship towards God is the way in which we are patterning ourselves after a moral imperative. Because we believe God is a certain way, and because we worship God in these certain manners, we also believe that we as humans are to act in a certain way in accordance with the patterns of God. And of course, one of the chief patterns of God is God's interaction with humanity, and again, most especially in the revealed scriptures of the Old and New Testament, most particularly in the revelation of God's self in Christ Jesus. But Cedric now wants to take a step back, probably a helpful step back, and counterbalance us thinking about moral decisions that we make with just kind of thinking about the decisions that we do make and how perhaps very little we think about the moral or the moral imperatives when we make certain decisions, even certain big life decisions. He starts out the chapter, I think, very helpfully by highlighting a couple of those particular areas of um, the decisions being made in a completely, um, and not necessarily a non-moral sense, but in a way that is not necessarily um, making the decision based upon a careful examination of only the moral sense. He talks about marriage. He said, getting married was something that was, you know, it was a response to falling in love. Um, remember the love chapter that we talked about of falling in love with someone is desiring an intimate relationship, desiring, again, a multifaceted sort of relationship. Romantic, of course, eros love being one of those things, but also a deep friendship, a self-giving love, self-sacrificial love of agape and phileo. But then again, as Cedric says, um, you really don't know what you're getting yourself into um, until you get many, many more years down the road. Um, God uh, be blessed that um, uh, Cedric had a long and happy marriage. Um, and the thing is, is that um, for him reflecting on that, of the point at which he and his spouse decided to get married um, was perhaps... Uh, not nearly the breadth or depth or height of what it meant to be married until way after the fact. Um, there was no amount of um, previous moral decision-making that could ever have prepared Sedgwick for what it meant to be married. I also like his comment about, uh, about kids. Um, having children was, uh, was far less of a moral question, uh, of a, a moral decision being made, um, than um, desiring to have children to raise, and he said that it was far more of uh, being hosp uh, hospitable to two additional strangers in your house, um, rather than making any sort of, um, any sort of uh, more uh, righteous sort of moral decision. Um, I, although bearing children is, of course, a wonderful and holy thing. Um, but the thing is, is that moral decision-making is not the only decision-making we make. And it's also, importantly, not a decision made that is um, not without some other parts that go into that decision-making. If life was only about making the correct decisions every time we sit down to make the correct decisions, we all of a sudden are robbed of any sort of creativity. If I have to ask the moral question as to whether it is morally right for me to have a ham sandwich versus it's, whether it's morally right for me to have a turkey sandwich, we can get into, tied into all sorts of knots about that. Or to perhaps put this a little, a little bit more benignly, the decision to have coffee with this friend of mine versus uh, going to lunch with this friend of mine, which is the right moral decision, that muddies the water a little bit about making a good moral decision. Um, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways, um, spending time with the friends that I love is a good moral decision no matter which decision I make. And it's not necessarily that we're weighing the balance of every decision that we're making, 
we're instead responding to something. And this is a key, key thing for Sedgwick, and I think a really key thing for Christian moral ethics, is that at the very base of Christian moral thinking is not, not an application of a checklist to our moral decision-making, but it rather is a response to a call of God. Even when we think of um, the perhaps um, most distantly related scriptures in the Old Testament, it is nonetheless, it always involves a call of God to something. Think about the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. When God created the heavens and the earth, um, there's this wonderful sort of interplay between God's speech act of creation. God calls the creation into existence. God speaks it into existence. God doesn't have to grab some stuff and squish it together and stuff like that. It is born purely out of a call, a voice act. And in fact, um, as we're going to talk about in an important theme throughout this chapter, the word vocation is actually descends from the Latin word that means to speak or to call. And so the thing is, is that God is actually... The created world that we live in right now is actually a vocation of God. God has called it into existence. And because we take that so seriously, we also then look at the creation of humanity. God calls humanity into existence. But not just that. God also calls humanity into relationship with God. Um, the garden and Adam and Eve that God places them in is actually a wonderful picture of what it meant to be in perfect relationship to both the one who made us and also the vocation that God has called us to, to um, exercise. Because remember, one of the most important things that we sometimes overlook in the, uh, in the Genesis 1 and 2 is that God calls Adam and Eve to tend the garden. There was work being done prior to the fall into sin. There's an aspect in which creativity and tending order and the careful paying attention to the stuff that God has called into existence is, in fact, a really one of the highest goods that we can have. We are in relationship with God, but we're also in proper relationship to all of the other things in which we are enmeshed with, creation being the chief one. Uh, whether that creation be another person made in the image of God, or the stuff of the creation of which God is called good. So, all of the things around us and us ourselves are called into being, but of course, when we talk about vocation, we also need to talk about, very specifically, calls of God to certain things at certain times that not everyone might be called to. We see this even as early as the call of Abraham. Abraham being called to go to a different place. The continuing covenant with Abraham. The call of Isaac and Jacob. And, of course, and the call of Moses at the burning bush to, to uh, rescue the people of Israel from the Egyptians. We can talk about all kinds of stories in the Old Testament. The call of Samuel, the call of Isaiah, the call of Jeremiah the prophet, the call of, um, uh, of Ezekiel the prophet, the call of John the Baptist. So you have all of these things that are meant as um, showing that God is constantly calling us into certain kinds of activities. And importantly, the call into certain kinds of activities are not merely the kinds of activities that we are paid for. And this is going to be really important here in just a moment. But let's start with the call that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, gives to the first disciples. The call of Andrew and his brother Simon Peter, who are fishing on the side of the Sea of Galilee. The call of James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were just a little bit down the shoreline from them. They are called into a particular kind of vocation, um, a particular kind of calling. Follow me, Jesus calls to them. And in other words, when Jesus is calling them, I highly doubt that what Jesus was doing was saying that fishing doesn't matter. Rather, 
Jesus was pointing at the disciples and saying that, I will make you fishers of men, to use the King James Version. I will make you fish for other things than fish. I will teach you how to fish. And Jesus basically is telling to them in this wonderful kind of, um, uh, this, this nice little rhetorical exchange that Jesus is often so good at. Jesus is not saying that what they were doing was not good. Jesus rather was saying, I am calling you to something new, something different, something that you are particularly called to as disciples, as apostles. And likewise, Jesus then commissions the apostles to then call others into the worship and discipline and life of the kingdom of God. Go therefore, Jesus commands them at the end of, of Matthew's gospel, into all the world, preaching the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages of ages. That Jesus is not simply giving them a task, a moral task to check off. Jesus is issuing a call that he is going to be with them, of course. Jesus is going to be alongside them in mysterious ways but that they are called to a specific task. Well, in the early church, there are also other kinds of calls within the church itself. When there were um, the poor of both the Greeks and the Jews within the places where the apostles were, um, they were noticing that the poor were being neglected. And so they called the first deacons of the church. You might recognize the name of St. Stephen the deacon. Um, they called those who had a particular calling of God in this particular manner. Because it, it actually is, is noted that, uh, that the uh, apostles recognized that their call of God was to teach and proclaim the gospel. And it was not their particular role for them to necessarily be waiters on tables. But again, it's, the apostles are not saying that it's not good for that to be done. It's just that they are recognizing their particular call of Jesus in what they need to be doing. And the deacons who are then called and are then blessed to then go out and perform these functions, that is something that is a completely good and necessary part of the life of the church. And again, it's not better to be an apostle or a deacon. Rather, the appropriate question is, what is Jesus' call on my life in this point? And so the vocation that God calls us into is one in which we are prepared for by God for the ministries in which we are exercising. And those calls don't have to be in the same sort of shape. And those calls also don't necessarily have to be born out of a merely mechanical sort of what's the best moral choice to make here. Because again, what's the better moral choice to be an apostle or to be a deacon? That's sort of a, that's sort of a bad question. <laughs> Rather, it's what am I called to do? Well, think about the history of the church itself. As Cedric, I think, very wonderfully points out, the history of the church is a struggle to get clear about what the call of God is on the church. And of course, the church being writ large is um, the call of God on the church in the various ways in which that body is formed. The church is not just an organization um, that is uh, serving clients in various ways. The church at its fundamental uh, building blocks is built upon the foundation of Jesus and that foundational aspect of Christ then calls the church into new things. So in some ways, it would be appropriate for us to not expect the church to ever look the same throughout history. However, there are certain things that the church can lay as bedrock as here is what the foundation of what we do is. And some of those markings of the bedrock of where we're at is the call of Jesus on us in various ways, but also in the call of Jesus to live, move, have our being in as best as we can a sanctified, repentant, holy relationship between God and us and us and the created world. We see this especially when it comes to the, the monastic movement of the 200s through 400s. 
the monastics, whenever um, the religion of Christianity becomes official, quote unquote official, in the Roman Empire, is one in which the monastics have a reaction against, because now Christianity is in the vogue, in the popular imagination, and the monastics recognize, I think appropriately, that Christian living is not tied to whether it is accepted by the majority or not. Rather, it is a fierce asceticism, and that word asceticism is training. It's a, it's a severe kind of training, but it's not what we necessarily say a harsh training. It's hard, it's a discipline, but the monastics, I think, demonstrate uh, throughout their stories that they tell, especially in, the, in one of the wonderful uh, um, records we have of the Desert Fathers and Mothers called the Philokalia um, that, we, that we have of that particular time. We have the stories of the wisdom of the desert uh, that show us how important it is for us to be in relationship and in proper awareness of God's presence and of our relationship to God and to the other. And cultivating that awareness, that relationship with that, is to actually cultivate the ability to be aware to the, and listening to the call of God on our lives specifically. Any monastic worth their, worth their salt is going to say that not everyone is called to be a monk. Rather, what is God's call on your life? What is God's specific vocation that God is calling you into? Well, one of the vocations of the church is repentance. We are called to turn back from where we have gone astray. Because even as good as the ideal of monasticism can be, when we get all the way to the medieval time period, the, the, the sort of high Middle Ages um, of the 1300s through the 1500s, we run across examples of how the religious life, uh, the, the uh, life of the monastics can also itself be turned into just a facade um, for uh, having it religiously all together and not actually be a vocation of call to repentance and amendment of life. Um, the religion, or the religious, the religious life of monasticism becomes a sort of stand-in for me having it all together in my pietistic observance. And this is, of course, something that Martin Luther uh, reacted to so strongly. Um, Martin Luther, of course, um, was an Augustinian monk. And Luther, in his own kind of way, was so... Um, hypochondriacal about not only himself, but also his sin, uh, that Luther, I think, importantly highlights that there are ideals of discipline, of course, but that discipline can never replace Jesus. And when it starts replacing Jesus, we have turned what is a good practice into the end of what we're trying to str uh, struggle for. And again, we've talked about the uh, the difference between the ends and the means to that end, right? Um, piety is the means towards the end of relationship, not the replacement for that relationship. And Luther, I think, was very sensitive to this, um, because when we put the things that we do, the works-based righteousness that uh, all our Protestant reformers were so allergic to, what the thing that they were chiefly reacting against is that we were placing the relationship with Jesus, born fully out of grace, fully out of self-giving love, was replaced by this sort of mechanical system of goods and bads, of do's and don'ts, of, um, of good practice, bad practice, discipline and laxity, where that's not really as cut and dried a picture as is really... Um, kind of shown within the scriptures or within the relationships that Jesus showed in the way that he connected with the people of his earthly ministry. Well, again, fast forward a couple hundred more years, and we see the other part of that working itself out, where when we have what's called the Protestant work, work ethic, you might have heard this language before, when we put ourselves very uh, um, ruggedly, rigidly to um, work is the thing that is going to help us work out our salvation. And again, this is not as works-based righteousness. This is simply 
Um, am I doing the morally upright thing of working? Am I working the things that I need to be doing? Well, when we, when we hit the industrial revolution, and likewise, as we move towards, um, the kind of modern economy of materialism that really begins um, to really take shape during the Industrial Revolution when um, when goods and trinkets were easily available um, to the working class, when things become cheap, easily producible, mass producible. One of the things that we begin to run into is the value of our work and our vocation become married together. And this is especially something that I think is uh, something we still struggle with today, is that when we talk about vocation, we often equate that with the work that we do. So my vocation as a priest is not by necessity the work that I do. Well, yes and no. Um, my vocation as a priest is a call of God first and foremost, whether or not I get paid for it. Um, and as weird as that might sound, especially to our American culture, um, it is absolutely the case that, that we have to keep the cart behind the horse, so to speak. When we think about vocation, we need to think less about am I compensated for the vocation that I have, and more about am I called by God into this particular thing. Let me tell you what. The most important people in my life have honestly been my teachers. And let me tell you what, a lot of my teachers were not teachers by their quote unquote work vocation. Um, my teachers were people who taught me things that they didn't have to get paid for doing. My Sunday school teachers growing up, they were not compensated <laughs> for what they were doing, but still they are some of the most important foundational teachers of my life. Um, I would not be where I'm at if it wasn't for my Sunday school teachers. Um, and we have to think about vocation in that way. Am I called by God into something specific that I might not be paid for, but that nonetheless God absolutely has called me into this kind of thing? So that, for example, um, those within the uh, congregations that worship Jesus around town are not merely... Um, lawyers are not merely farmers, are not merely uh, vocationally called to be dentists or physicians um, or uh, to work at the bank or things like that. They have vocations that bridge far beyond what they are called to do as they earn a wage. Of course, it's a part of what that call is at that particular point in time in their life, but it is never the fullness of what that vocation means. And the call of God is something that, again, as Sedgwick is going to, uh, has said um, and is going to say continuously, the call of God is the most important moral thing that happens to us. And it has nothing to do um, or very little to do with sort of a sitting down and weighing of whether what the correct decision is. It's sort of like, um, it's sort of like did I make the correct decision by having children? Well, the thing is, is that, that that's, again, a bad question. Um, the correct or incorrect decision to have children um, is, I don't think, ever a, a, ever a question that can ever be answered, even if one's children turn out to be morally upright or not. That decision to have children is um, impossible to weigh. Um, in the uh, in the sort of scales and balances of whether this was a morally right decision or morally wrong decision to have. Because, again, it is rather that there are more operating principles behind moral decision-making than just simply the bland moral decision-making of itself. Rather, it is a response to God. It is a response to the call of God. A call of God that finds people in situations in which they are often unprepared for the task of which they're given. To give one last little note on this, think about all of the calls of God throughout the scriptures and how every single one of them, it's a constant theme, every single one of them, the ones that are most memorable in the scriptures are the ones who were least qualified at the beginning. 
Think about, think about some of the examples. Moses is called by God to ransom his people from the Egyptian people. Moses was raised as an Egyptian in Pharaoh's household, was uh, raised in a manner in which was probably far removed from the Hebrew struggle, of which Moses probably knew very little about except for what he was exposed to. He didn't, uh, he didn't necessarily experience the persecution. And in, in, all, in all honesty, um, if you remember in, in the Old Testament, Moses commits murder because of what, because of retaliation for what one of the Egyptian taskmasters was doing to one of the other Hebrew slaves. And the Hebrew slaves tell on Moses and he has to escape the country. Was Moses the most holy and obvious person to ransom the people of Israel from that particular circumstance? I think that we can answer, maybe not. And yet God called Moses to do it. Think about Simon Peter and Andrew. James and John on the side of on the side of the Galilean shores were they the perfect examples of someone who was going to teach the Christian faith to the next tradition? No. What would have been the right choice, quote unquote, right choice uh, to make was to um, call someone who was already involved in teaching. Maybe he could have. Um, called um, the uh, his fellow colleagues, um, those within the Jewish shuls, um, those uh, who were already uh, being trained as rabbis and things like that, those who were of a higher nobility. That's not what Jesus did. And it should be noted, by the way, that the reverse happens. From these Galilean fishermen, who in the Acts of the Apostles, when they were speaking about Jesus, the crowds, it says in the Acts of the Apostles, recognized that these were that the, these were untrained, these were uneducated men, and they knew they had been with Jesus. And what did that effect have? Guess what? A large number of the Pharisees become followers of Jesus in the Acts of the Apostles. And we see um, that particular kind of observance um, being alive and well within the fledgling early church through the discipleship of the secret disciple of Nicodemus a named Pharisee disciple of Jesus. Um, and the um, the idea is that uh, Jesus did not, as one, as, a, as preachers have used for years and years and years, Jesus does not call the qualified. Jesus qualifies the called. And that our vocation primarily is about a response to God's call, even when it might be mysterious, even when we might not feel qualified, and even when there's not a clear moral decision to be made in that circumstance.